So in 11.5, we are going to talk about mutations. And a mutation is a heritable change in the DNA sequence of an organism. So a heritable change in the DNA sequence of an organism. So this isn't just a change that is not going to be passed on. That's why it mentions heritable in the definition there. So it's something that's going to be passed along because this is a more permanent change in the DNA sequence. Um, so a mutation is this permanent change, and we have different types of mutations. Um, and mutations are dangerous um, and not good for the organism, generally speaking. Um, sometimes it can be okay, and we'll talk about the differences there. But the reason is because they can lead to changes in the protein sequence that's then encoded by the DNA. So if the DNA itself is changed, then it could lead to things down the line. So meaning it will then replace amino acids that are important for the structure of a particular protein with a different amino acid. And when it does that, then it may not fold or bend the same, the same way, and then it won't function as an enzyme the way that it should. So the first term that you need to be aware of is the wild type. And the wild type is the phenotype that's found in nature. So a phenotype found in nature. So found in the wild. Um, so this is what the DNA should be because should meaning that's what's already found in nature. It hasn't been manipulated in any way in the lab or otherwise. Then we have a mutant. Uh, so this is one that may have a noticeable change from the wild type. So may have a noticeable change from the wild type. So we're going to talk about these noticeable changes from the wild type and how we get these different types of changes. So the first type of mutations we're going to talk about are point mutations. And point mutations, as kind of the name implies, is this is when it affects a single base. So it affects a single base. So meaning one single A, one single T, one single C, one single G. One single base is going to be affected by this particular mutation. And so there are different types of point mutations. So the first type of point mutation we're going to talk about is the silent mutation. In a silent mutation, this has no effect on the protein sequence. So the way that we take a look at these mutations is how it's going to end up affecting the protein down the line. So once we have translated or transcribed and then translated into a protein, then what's going to be, how is this protein going to be affected by this change in DNA? So silent means that there is no effect on the protein sequence. And the reason for this is because of the redundancy in the code. Remember the code meaning all of those codons. So we have lots of ways that we can get at an alanine or lots of ways that we can get a cytosine or you know various amino acids. <clears throat> and so then this means that this causes no change in the amino acid that is added. So no change in the amino acid that is added. And so that's why this is a silent mutation. So it's, it's mutated, it's not how we would find it in the wild type, um, but it doesn't ch change the protein that's made. The second type is called a missense mutation. So this is when we actually end up having a different amino acid. So in this case, in a different amino acid has been substituted because we have one single base pair that's been changed, and then this affects the amino acid that is placed there. So instead of having something like a CCC, for example, which would give us proline, instead we have this first one is going to be affected. It's going to have that point mutation happen, and so then we're going to end up with, say, ACC, which would give us threonine. So this is going to give us a completely different type of amino acid, which means that that protein is going to be affected. Now the effect is going to depend on how different the amino acid is that has been replaced um, from the wild type. So if 
This first amino acid is a basic amino acid and it's been replaced by a different basic amino acid. It may have very little effect on the protein, um, but if a basic amino acid has been replaced with, say, an acidic amino acid, then it would, might have a large effect on the protein and maybe wouldn't even function anymore. So the effect depends on how different... the added amino acid is. So then the third type of point mutation is called a nonsense mutation. Um, so this is when it changes the codon into a stop codon. So we have a point mutation. So one is going to be moved, it's going to be switched, and it's going to end up coding for a stop codon. In this case, then, of course, since it's a stop codon, it's not going to continue on as it's supposed to continue on, and it automatically stops the making of the protein and it falls apart. And then, of course, this is going to give us a, a very short, um, or maybe not very short, maybe it's just missing a single amino acid, but in either way, it's going to be shortening that protein. Um, because it's stopping it prior to when it would normally stop it, and then we end up with a non-functional protein. So um, this changes the codon to a stop codon. So then we end up getting a short non-functional protein. So then the next point mutation, it's kind of two similar ones. They are insertions and deletions. So an insertion or a deletion. We'll say it that way. So as their name implied or implies, we would add one or more bases in this case. So in insertion, we insert an additional base. So on accident, an additional base is added, and so this is going to change things. And these two are very similar, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So conversely, uh, with a deletion, of course, then it is the removal, removal of one or more bases. So if we remove one or more bases, then we are going to, if it's completely removed and we don't replace it with anything else, um, or if we add or insert um, additional bases, then what we have is a frame shift mutation. So a frame shift mutation is a shift in the reading frame. So shift in the reading frame. So if we think about the way that DNA is um, designed, again, we have our codons, right? And so each three nucleotides is a codon. We start at the beginning um, of this particular protein, of this mRNA. Remember that the ribosome is going to attach to the five prime cap, and then we have an initiation sequence. We start at the initiator, um, and then we have our first codon. Our first codon is going to match up with this anticodon, which is going to bring us methionine because we, our start codon is always the same. Then after that, we have every three nucleotides is going to be a codon. So if we have something like in our DNA, we have our A, G, C, G, T, A, C, 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 T, A, C. So this is our DNA here. Then, of course, we would make our mRNA from that, and then we would get our protein from that. So in this case, our protein, we would have these three amino acids. So we would split it up into three. This is our reading frame. So our reading frame is these three nucleotides, these three nucleotides, and on and on. So we would have serine, we would have valine, proline, and tyrosine. So these are our... This is our reading frame. Now, if we have an insertion or a deletion, then we're going to have a change in this reading frame, which is what leads to what's called a frame shift mutation. So if we go in and say we get rid of this T and A right here, if we accidentally delete those, so those are removed, then what we have is A, G, C, 
G C C C T A C is now our DNA. So then we would make our mRNA and then our protein. In this case, our reading frame would now be this instead. <clears throat> so then what we end up with is, say, serine is still the same here because we still have A, G, C. But now instead of having valine here, now what we have is alanine. Now then we have, oops, leucine. And let's say another leucine if we have a C and then another T and A, for example. And so now we have completely different proteins. So not only do we not have a valine here, we don't have a proline or a tyrosine next. We have leucine and leucine and on and on. So we have a completely different protein being made if we have an insertion or a deletion. Um, which, of course, then is going to be a big problem because if it's a key protein, which, you know, oftentimes they are, um, and they don't have a backup protein for that same function, then it can lead to the death of an organism or a cell, for example. So, as we can see, we have a change in every amino acid after the point of mutation. So how do we get these mutations? How do these mutations happen? So first of all, we have spontaneous mutations. So this is just simply we have DNA replication errors. So as we're going in and we're replicating DNA or the organism is replicating DNA, we accidentally pick up one nucleotide, we have, and then we put in a different nucleotide. Um, so there's an accident there. Spontaneously, we have a replication error. Then there are also induced mutations. So in an induced mutation, this is when we have exposure to mutagens. And so when we have something that is exposed to a mutagen, then it's going to cause any one of those mutations, any of those point mutations that we just spoke about. So anything that does cause a mutation is called a mutagenic agent. Mutagenic agent. And mutag mutagenic agents are oftentimes carcinogenic. So are they frequently carcinogenic. So carcinogenic meaning causes cancer, right? Causes cancer. So notice that it's not that all mutagenic agents are carcinogenic or causing cancer. It's just that most times something that will cause a mutagen or a, a mutation rather is carcinogenic and can cause cancer. Um, Nearly all carcinogens are mutagenic. So things that cause cancer, oftentimes the reason or the way that they cause cancer is because they cause mutations in DNA. But it not, it's not always necessarily the other way around. So other things can be a mutagenic agent that are not carcinogenic, but oftentimes things that are carcinogenic are mutagenic. So nearly all carcino are mutagenic. Good. So then we have our different types of muta mutagenic agents. So we have chemical mutagens. So in the case of chemical mutagens, what we have are base analogs which are chemicals that are going to modify existing bases, and then they can cause spaces in the DNA. So our chemical mutagens are base analogs. They're chemicals that modify existing bases and cause bases in DNA. So we can find ourselves um, interacting with a chemical. I think an example in the book is nitrous acid. Um, and the nitrous acid is going to change the base um, and change it into something that looks perhaps similar 
to that base. So it could be, I think the example in text is a cytosine is affected by nitrous acid, and then that makes it look like a uracil. And then that uracil is going to match up with an adenine, but it's not actually a uracil, it's actually a cytosine. So then it causes a problem there. It's, it's a mutation. So it can change those existing bases, and then it can cause spaces in the DNA. So then we can have issues coming from that. So that can cause a completely different amino acid to be added to the chain, and then we have a completely different protein. So we have our chemical mutagens. We also have ionizing radiation that can cause mutations. So our chemical mutagens can cause mutations. Our ionizing radiation can cause mutations. So these are things like x-rays and our gamma rays. So x-rays and gamma, gamma rays. And what these do is they break that backbone. So they break the phosphodiester backbone of DNA. Um, and then this can change the way that the DNA functions. So it can break it on both sides, so it can have a double strand break. And when it does that, then we can kind of untwist the DNA, it can kind of glue back together incorrectly. Or we can have a single strand break, in which case then it can just chemically modify those bases and alter the base pairing rules, the way that they're going to base pair. Because we have the break, and then it might accidentally add something else in there, it can um, re-anneal incorrectly. And so ionizing radiation, so x-rays and gamma rays, that's of course why we have to wear lead vests and things like that when we um, get x-rays of our teeth, for example, or other parts of our body if something perhaps is broken. Um, and that's to protect our DNA, to protect it from this ionizing radiation. So then we also have our non-ionizing radiation. So our non-ionizing radiation is like UV light, so sunlight, right? <clears throat> and in this case, sunlight is damaging because it may introduce, introduce thymine dimers or pyrimidine dimers. So remember, pyrimidines are the types of, are two types of our nucleotides. In this case, really what we see are thymine dimers. That's a common uh, mutation from non-ionizing radiation or from UV light. And so in this case, what we see is when we have our, our sugar phosphate and sugar phosphate backbone, and we have a thymine here and a thymine here, and then of course that's matched up naturally over here with its adenine. <clears throat> when this DNA is exposed to UV light, so when we're out in the sun, any of our cells in our body that are exposed to this UV light can cause thymine dimers, which means that these thymine are going to attach to each other and no longer be attached to the adenine across the way. So they end up annealing to each other or attaching to each other. This end up, ends up bending or kinking the DNA here, and then this can cause a frame shift mutation or a point mutation. Um, so this may introduce a frame shift mutation. So remember, a frame shift mutation was either an insertion or a deletion. And a point or, so or a point mutation. And the point mutations were where we had our silent mutation, our miss sense mutation, and our nonsense mutations. I don't think I made that clear earlier. So frame shift mutations are those that are going to shift the frame, right? Um, but our point mutation doesn't necessarily shift the frame. So it can be a silent or a missense or a nonsense. Um, but our frame shift mutations are going to be either insertions or deletions. And so in this case, we can end up having an insertion or deletion because we have this weird kink here. And then when our enzymes go in to try to fix the DNA, it may notice that these adenines are not bonded to something or not um, hydrogen bonded to something across the way there. And so it may add some additional thiamine, for example, to try to bond with the amino acids, or it might take this whole thing out and then just um, anneal whatever um, uh, nucleotide is over here and whatever nucleotides over here next to each other. Um, or it may just replace these thiamines with something else. 
um, because it may take out this entire section, which then may cause a point mutation. It could not sh change the, sh um, the reading frame, but it could still affect the protein greatly. So it just depends on how the body repairs that thymine dimer, but it does cause problems. It's kind of like the, I, I think a thymine dimer is like the zipper that kind of gets looped where you accidentally skipped over, skip over a couple of teeth or something, and then the whole rest of the zipper is messed up the rest of the way. That's like a frame shift mutation um, causing or being caused by a thymine dimer because something kind of bends weird in the zipper, and then the entire rest of the zipper all the way up, um, I think of a coat, all the way up on the rest of the coat or hoodie or something is all incorrect. Everything's shifted slightly, and then the top doesn't end up working right, and then the whole thing is kind of messed up. And that's how our proteins end up in that case. So even though these things happen, we do have proofreading. So there is DNA repair. So, for example, our bodies, our cells, but then also other organisms that we can talk about, any of our prokaryotic organisms or other microorganisms, have proofreading. So our DNA polymerase is going to double check and any newly added base. So there is this proofreading right when replication is happening. So DNA polymerase is going to double check the newly added base. And then it will remove bases or add bases as needed. So remove and replace as needed. So we do have that proofreading ability right at the beginning. But then we also have mismatch repair. So shortly after replication, we can have an, in, an exonuclease that goes in. It'll remove that mismatch, and then that gap will be filled in by DNA polymerase 3 and DNA ligase, because remember, DNA ligase has to go in and attach that last little nick there that any of our DNA polymerases is, is, are unable to do. So our mismatch repair... All right, so shortly after replication, the exonuclease removes the mismatch. The gap is filled in by DNA polymerase 3 and DNA ligase. So then we have the ability to repair those thymine dimers. And there are two ways that we see um, our cells and other cells repairing those thymine dimers. So remember, if we look up here with these thymine dimers, I did talk about kind of replacing and trying to fix this, but I think what I probably should have spoken about up here was more along the lines of how the transcription is going to be incorrect based on this. So rather than us going in and talking about DNA repair up here, more so if we have a thymine dimer and it's not repaired, then what can happen is we'll have our shame, frame shift mutation or point mutation because when we are going along and doing transcription and then therefore translation later, our enzymes for transcription are going to have a problem here with this thymine dimer. It causes that kink in there. It can bump over and just skip this whole section and therefore have frame shift mutation. It can try to code for one or both of these thymine here. Um, and then that can cause a problem if it doesn't do it correctly. Um, so we have some issues there with going through transcription and then therefore translation will get the incorrect protein. <clears throat> So when our body is trying to, or other organisms are trying to repair those thymine dimers from that UV light, we can either do it through nucleotide excision repair, or we can do it through photoreactivation. And those are respectively called dark repair and light repair. So we have our nucleotide excision repair. which is, again, called dark repair uh, because it doesn't require light. So we have our DNA is going to be scanned by a complex. It's going to cut and remove the section with the thymine dimers. And then the DNA polymerase 1 is going to replace those nucleotides. And then DNA ligase is going to seal that back up, so kind of close up that gap again. So there we go, DNA is scanned by the complex, cuts and removes the section, DNA polymerase 1 replaces the nucleotides, DNA ligase seals the gap. 
Um, I am going to put a picture from the text in here in just a moment, but I want to uh, just quickly go through the second one. So the second one is called photo reactivation. And again, this is called light repair because it does utilize light to repair. And in this case, this again is in the presence of light, an enzyme called photolyase is going to break apart the thiamine dimer, so where they have attached to each other, and then it's going to allow those thiamines to then correctly attach and base pair with those adenines on that complementary strand. Um, so when light is available, uh, it's possible that photolyase is going to come in and fix this. Um, and then it won't cause a problem for transcription and therefore translation. So I'm going to write this out and then I'm going to bring in the image of these two things so we can take a closer look at them. All right, so let me move this out of the way here. You can see that I wrote about the photo reactivation here. And we are going to take a look at this image from the text. So we have our UV light up here at the top that is causing that thiamine dimer there. You can see they're kind of attached to each other there, which causes this lumping or this kinking of the DNA. On the left-hand side, you can see the nucleotide excision repair. So it's going to, this exonuclease is going to cut the strand and it shows you that it cuts it over here. It's not just going for the thiamines, it's gonna cut it in these places here. And then it's going to excise that entire section. So then the DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase are going to make those repairs and replace them with the correct nucleotides without the dimer. On the right-hand side, we have the photoreactivation. So in the presence of light, then that light is just going, the photolyase is going to come in. It's going to remove this thiamine dimer, and then the thiamines are going to correctly base pair with the adenines across the way on the complementary strand. All right, so lastly, we are going to take a look at how we can use this. Um, so we can use it with our oxotrophs. So we can have an oxotrophic identification of mutants. So what we're talking about here is an oxotroph. So let's define oxotroph. An oxotroph has a mutation in a gene that encodes for an enzyme in the biosynthesis pathway of a specific nutrient. So for example, it is unable to synthesize histidine. So in this case, an oxytroph is something that is unable to make histidine in this example, and that's because there's a mutation in one of the enzymes that's required to make histidine. Um, so this particular organism, if it's an oxytroph, now cannot have this end product because there's a mutation in that gene that encodes for it. Now we can determine this by doing something called replica plating. And in replica plating, what we're doing is after we have mutated something, the colonies that grow on nutritionally complete medium, um, but not on medium that lacks histidine, are identified as those histidine oxytrophs. All right, so I'm actually going to bring in the image from the text here so we can take a closer look at what exactly this means. And then, of course, apply it to the Ames test, which is important because that's what's relating to this information. All right, so here is the image from the text. And so we can see here on the left-hand side that we have a medium that contains histidine. So it has histidine there. So even if it is an oxytroph that's unable to make histidine, then these colonies will still be able to grow because histidine is available in the medium. So then we can take this sterile velvet surface. Uh, velvet's nice and soft. It picks things up very easily but doesn't damage things. So we can press this inside of that petri plate there, as it says here. So press the sterile valve onto the plate and picks up cells from the bacterial colonies. Then you can take that and transfer it to new plates. So we have the medium that contains histidine, and then we have the medium that lacks histidine. So we can take this and we can press it onto the first plate, lift it up, and press it onto the second plate. And we can get, <coughs> see, you can see actually they have these lines here so that you can tell where they have lined up this um, velvet um, circle so that they can set it down exactly the same each time and then you can compare between the two plates after incubation. 
So then when we look at the end here, the medium can, that contains histidine, if an oxytroph is growing, it can still grow on that medium. So they're showing that there's an oxytroph of mutant here because you can see all of these um, colonies here that are growing on this medium that contains histidine. But if you look at the medium over here that does not contain histidine, we are missing this colony. So all of the other colonies are present, um, which means it doesn't matter if histidine is there or not, they're going to grow because they can make histidine. But this missing colony means that it cannot grow on this medium because it lacks histidine. And if it doesn't have histidine and it can't make histidine, then it can't grow. So we can compare these growths and then we can determine uh, where the oxytrophic mutant is. Now this is important when we get to the last piece of this section, which is the AIMS test. And the AIMS test is for mutagenicity. AIMS test for... Mutagenicity. Um, so what the AIMS test does is that it's going to identify something that's mutagenic and potentially carcinogenic. So it's going to identify those chemicals. So it identifies mutagenic and potentially carcinogenic chemicals. So this test, the AIMS test, is something that can be used to try to determine if something is carcinogenic. So this is something that would be used in industry. Um, so if somebody's developing um, some sort of food item, they want to test it and make sure that it's not carcinogenic before they put it you know, up to the FDA and, and move it through the system. Or um, say a, a makeup product or a skin product, something that could be carcinogenic if it's placed on the body they can utilize this test to see if something is potentially carcinogenic or mutagenic. So a salmonella histidine oxytroph is used for this. Salmonella A salmonella histidine oxytroph is used as the test strain. This test strain is then exposed to a potential mutagen or carcinogen. So it's exposed to potential mutagen or carcinogen. Then the number of reversion mutants that are capable of growing in the absence of the histidine is counted. So it's sort of the opposite of what we just saw a moment ago. Then that's compared with the number of natural reversion mutants that arise in the absence of that potential mutagen. So those that are not exposed to the potential mutagen, we compare the two. So let's go ahead and bring in the image from the text on this one again. All right, so here is the image from the text. Let's take a look. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, it describes what we're going through here. So number one, we're going to add rat liver extract and salmonella to top the control tube. So in here we have salmonella strain, the salmonella histidine oxytroph strain. So this is one that requires histidine because remember it's an oxytroph, which means it cannot make its own histidine because it has a mutation inside of, uh, one, inside of the gene for one of the enzymes. Over here, we have the same thing, right? So we have the salmonella strain, that oxytroph, and that's what we're going to use to see if we have a possible mutagen. So on the left-hand side, this is our control over here. And so our control, in order to have it equal and have the same type of stuff except for the mutagen, we add this rat liver extract. So we add the rat liver extract to kind of top this tube off. And then on the right-hand side, we add rat liver extract as well, but then we also add that possible mutagen. So we're testing whether or not it is mutagenic. So after these things are mixed, <clears throat> then they're going to be plated on these plates here and then incubated, and then we can take a look at it. And so they are plated on a medium that lacks histidine. So it requires histidine in order for it to grow but the medium down here is going to lack histidine. So 
if we have an oxytroph, right, it requires histidine so it won't be able to grow. So the only thing that should be able to grow here is what's called a natural revertant here or a revertant. So meaning that these have reverted back to the wild type, meaning without that histidine oxytroph, without that mutation in the gene. So when the cells are exposed to the rat liver extract, um, they're going to be going through and they'll be doing some repairs and, and fixing of the DNA. So as it's going through and doing repairs and fixing the DNA, some of them will anyway. And so then we'll have a natural revertant group here. And that's why it's a control because this will naturally happen within cells sometimes. And so we have, you can see here, we have the two colonies that are growing because they just naturally reverted back to their non-mutated type. On the right-hand side, however, we have our possible mutagen. And if a cell or a whole bunch of cells here, if a bunch of salmonella cells are exposed to a possible mutagen, then all of its anti-mutagenic stuff, meaning all of its repairing stuff, is going to go into high gear. It's going to be trying to repair from this mutagen, right? Because if the mutagen um, is going to be placed in with all of these cells, the mutagen starts doing what it does by mutating DNA then there's going to be a lot of repairing happening. With all of this repairing happening, then down here it shows that we have a high number of revertants. So those that can grow on this media, even though it doesn't have histidine, and that's because they've gone through and they've fixed themselves. They've reverted back to the wild type because they are in the process of <clears throat> trying to fix themselves. Um, so then that is going to suggest that this mutagen actually does cause mutations. Um, in this case, so you can see we've got a large difference between the number of revertants here on the right-hand side and the number of revertants that just naturally revert back in our control group. And so that tells us that this possible mutagen is likely a mutagen. And so then these cells have been changed and reverted back to being able to make their own histidine.